Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 162, The Problem with Talent with Joshua Mazur. This episode was a product of a submission on the main page here at Coralosophy.com. The prompt really grabbed me. Guest Joshua Mazur suggested that we need to have a grown-up discussion about the way we in music education think about and use the word talent. And I agree. From Joshua's submission, I quote, Our society approaches talent and ability in music in a completely unproductive way. I have seen people with very beautiful singing voices forced to sing in choirs despite the fact that they don't want to, and people with more average singing voices discouraged from doing so, despite their strong desire to sing. Most ordinary people think they're unworthy of taking part in important music making, like community and church music projects, because they don't sound like the people they hear on recordings. They don't recognize the effect a musically literate choir of 30 people, despite having, air quotes, average nature of their voices, can have on their communities and oftentimes even on themselves. We can take 12 people, for example, with voices no one would pay to hear as soloists and make them into a very good choir. This could could be thought of one of the great magics of ensemble music making. The whole can be greater than the sum of its parts, and even better, the individual parts can also be made greater in the process. This is the win-win of ensemble music. That's why it deserves such a central place in our educational settings, in our church and community settings. It's powerful, and we should advocate for that. In this episode, you're going to hear us discuss the false idea that musical ability is completely innate and fixed, and how to combat this idea in our ensembles, as well as concepts from Daniel Coyle's The Talent Code, which is a must-read text for any teacher or coach, and much more in this very meaty conversation. So stick around. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. When this episode drops, this is an August 2023 episode. School has either just started or it's about to start for most of the educators in the audience. This is your reminder and your opportunity. Make sure your sight reading factory membership is up to date, and all of your students have memberships if possible. You can get a 10% discount by entering Coralosophy at checkout, regardless of how many student memberships you get, and that 10% is going to help the program budget a lot, and Sight Reading Factory, of course, is a critical tool. For more on how I use Sight Reading Factory, I encourage you to go to coralosophy.com forward slash music literacy. Attention performing arts directors, are you looking for a platform that understands your unique needs? Look no further than Ludus.com. Built from the ground up for the performing arts by people from the arts, Ludus is the perfect solution for your organization. With Ludus, you can drive revenue with ticket sales, merchandise, and fundraising, all while saving time, money, and resources. And the best part? It's 100% free to your program. Sign up for Ludus today and take your performing arts program to the next level. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. Patreon page is what really, literally, keeps this light on that is shining in front of me to make sure that I can continue to do, do the show forever. So head on over there. There are, of course, various levels that you can join. And at the producer or above level, we have Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Clixbull, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, Carlos, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Head to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and join the crowd. All right, everybody, I am here with Joshua Mazur, and we're going to discuss some of the problems around the concept and the word talent. Of course, as music educators, we hear talent all the time. That is a word that gets thrown around our environments. And this episode came from a submission at Coralosophy.com from Joshua. Uh, And I'm going to give, I'm just going to quote what you said, and then we're going to, you're going to introduce yourself here. So, um, our society approaches talent and ability in music in a completely unpredictive way. Most ordinary people think they're unworthy of taking part in in some types of music, and I'm paraphrasing now of what you wrote in to the show, and and so that kind of sets us up because I I agree uh, with the idea that uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings and um, I I would even say colloquialisms that we use with the word talent uh, that can be very unproductive. So Joshua, welcome, and thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure to be here, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. So first, why don't we just start out with uh, you telling everyone who you are? What what do you do, and where do you do it, and that kind of thing. 
Sure, absolutely. My name is Joshua Mazur, and I am the full-time uh, staff musician of the Director of Music Ministry here at Abiding Savior Lutheran Church in Gainesville, Florida. In addition to that, I'm an adjunct professor of music theory at the College of Central Florida and the director of the symphonic choir with the Ocala Symphony Orchestra. Exciting. That's a, that's wonderful. So why don't we start out by just having you tell me and the listeners uh, what what caused you to uh, you know be concerned with this concept enough to where you write into the Choralosophy podcast and saying, hey, I want to go talk to people about this talent problem. Absolutely. Well, this has been something that uh, has been on my mind since I started in music. And when I say that, I mean, imagine a four-year-old me in front of this rickety piano in the fellowship hall of my church growing up. I remember distinctly um, standing at that piano and sort of making sounds. And I remember this one person from the congregation sort of came over and abruptly asked me to stop and close the piano and everything. And I remember this army of church ladies marching across that fellowship hall, I think from the kitchen, they were working hard and they said, don't you dare tell that little boy he can't play that piano. And uh, <laughs> that, that dude learned his lesson. And um, ever since then, I mean, like what, what if, what if they hadn't done that? What, what if he had told me not to play the piano and then I didn't, and then I never did again. And so I well, keep little old church ladies, that. sorry, little old church ladies are heroes. So we just, yes. Have to yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Go they ahead. Are, all of them are heroes. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, ever since then, I, now I can't say ever since then, but I frequently think back on that. And um, as I got better as a musician, as I decided to go uh, to college and, and study music and things like that, you know, you get to a certain level of performance and ability where people just think, oh, he is so talented. They're so talented. It must be so easy for them. Well, music has never been easy for me. Music has always been difficult. It's always been a matter of time spent and encouragement received. And um, so that got me thinking as I've listened to this podcast, as I've worked in music, as I um, started teaching particularly young adults in, in, a, in what, what is historically a community college, the College of Central Florida, um, is, is, is this function of, of encouragement and of recognition. And it really does not have anything to do with anyone having been blessed by Mozart at birth or whatever um, to become this great musician. It's, it's a function of other things. And um, as I work here at the church, I'm, I'm uh, confronted all the time with people who say, I've always wanted to sing in a choir, but I never did. And that just breaks my heart because they, there's a variety of reasons why they think this, and we can talk about that later. But that got, that's always had me thinking about talent and why I love when people come to auditions like for the symphony chorus and they say i have no idea why i'm here and i say to them well it's probably because you want to sing in a choir right and they're like <laughs> yes but i don't have any experience what do you mean you don't have any experience well i only sing at church well how many years have you been singing in church 15 years well it's 15 years 20 years 30 years 40 years that's not experience that's not something we can take and mold and grow and build that's you don't think that's going to help you and they, they always look at me like it's the greatest gift they've ever gotten that they've been sort of told that this experience that they've written off um matters and counts towards their ability to do things so yeah that's what got me thinking about it it's particularly coming out of the pandemic while you know people are thinking a little differently about that and about what they're doing with their time right yeah now that's that's a really good summary because i i think there's a there's a certain mythology in in the culture that I see as the root of this, and I also want to see if you have theories about the where this comes from. My theory essentially is that we believe that music, kind of almost like uniquely, uh, is just a gift you're given. So I have this experience all the time when I sing a solo at church. Um, even though little old church ladies are heroes, sometimes they are guilty of this myth as well because they'll come up to me and just talk about how. You know, the Lord has blessed me with this voice, and, um, you know, I've even had people come up to me after church and asked if I've ever thought about taking voice lessons. You know, and I'm like, uh, yes, actually, I've been doing that for 20 plus years, and this is a thing that I work really, really hard at. But there, and I feel like um, maybe sports is a corollary, corollary where some of the same mythology exists, where people will talk about athletes purely in the sense of their gifts, 
rather than in the sense of, of the work that goes in that you don't see. Um, so do you feel like, are, are we, are we singing the same tune about where some of these things come from? Do you think? Absolutely. And I, I bet you there's a juncture of understanding, um, at about the place where, where we start calling young athletes, athletes, when do children and young adolescents stop being playful children and become athletic with, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of playtime that occurs before, one is considered athletic and you become an athlete and you join a team. Mm. Um, and that is certainly not discounted by coaches and by people who study, you know, how, how do I develop a running person from the time they're crawling? Um, there's, there's a lot of fascinating study done in that, that area, but for some reason, there's a little bit of a different thing in music. It's like, we, we don't consider all that playtime before we, you know, are branded with the title musician um, as part of that, and I, I don't see how a passionate musicianship could grow out of anything else other than musical play, mm -hmm. um, whether it be when you're a kid or or adults. Um, but the, but the idea of music of musicianship and athleticism is a huge parallel for me. Right. Yeah. One of the things I've done, and um, of course, I start in my day job, teach students, and they start in ninth grade when they come to, to my class. And one of the things that I will do occasionally is I will, and school starts next week, so I will definitely remember to do that this year, uh, is to ask them, how many of you consider yourself musicians? Just on the first day of school. Um, very. When I ask that type of question, a very small number of kids raise their hand. Uh, at, as, a, as a percentage of the total kids in the class. Um, and then we'll have a, it'll give us a chance to have a little bit of a philosophical discussion right off the bat. And I was like, well, but you signed up for a music class. What, did it, what is it that you hope to achieve by taking this class? Sometimes it's, oh, I just want to get my fine arts credit. Okay. And then I'll say, but in order to do that, you're going to have to learn to be a musician for this year. <laughs> like, so what, is it, so what does it mean uh, to be a musician? And then we can have that conversation. And I like how you brought, the, brought up the corollary to calling a kid who's playing an athlete. And so maybe a good way to dive into this is, uh, at first, I want to just kind of put you on the spot with a direct question. Would you say, like if someone were to ask you, does talent exist? Would you, would you be taking a hardline position that talent does not even exist? Or is it that we use the word the wrong way? I think we apply the wrong the word the wrong way. Okay. I, I I consider talent to be desire, and so you you can have someone who uh, really has no skill other than a sheer ton of desire, and and they can go further than the people that have some ability, but then come to the choir and don't work as hard as they do. Um, that lesson was taught to me very well by my uh, college choir director. Um, I have a weird story in that I wanted to be a composer and then they closed the composition area and I decided to take piano and then my dad died and I was like I need to just flip this on its head I want to do something different so I switched to voice uh, midway through my freshman year and when I did I joined the choir and who was directing that choir other than Carol Krieger at Florida Southern College mm -hmm. and uh, she just kicked my ass in a lot of different ways in a, in a beautiful way and um, she you know, taught me that there was a lot more to learn. And it's the second you believe you've arrived, there's even more to go. And then taught me how to inspire that in people who are just starting and people who are just finishing. I mean, it can, anybody is going up the spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful and, and amazing. Now I'm going to throw out my idea and I just want your reaction to it because I, I think that I also would put myself in the camp of we just use the word talent the wrong way. I might define talent, though, a little bit differently than how you just did, in the sense that I, I do think that talent exists in that uh, there are some kids who come to an activity for the very first time in their young life, and they can just do more than other kids from, from day one. At, in other words, you can't make uh, a lot of really solid arguments that that kid um, had, you know, more opportunities to be exposed to that thing because it's like literally day one and it's like their very first attempt at a thing. Uh, coaching my son's baseball was a great example of this when he was little. Uh, there were some kids that have ne literally never picked up a bat before and they pick it up and they their swing looks pretty and the ball goes a long way. You know, they, they're, they're, not, they're not having desire. They're not showing work ethic. They're just doing it better than other people on day one. And, and, there are, and that exists in music also. Um, and so when I think sometimes when people use the word talent, that's what they mean. 
my, the way I see the, the unproductivity, so to speak, is when people think that that's what matters more than all the other stuff. And, and so another way, to, another way to analogize it would be some, at least in my experience, what I see is that some kids in sports, music, etc., any of these work, uh, activities where we use talent to describe it, uh, for some reason we don't use that with math. I don't, I don't know. But like, um, but the, it's that some kids start on a different rung of the ladder. Um, and but I, what I wish people would do is focus more on which rung of the ladder they end up on. <laughs> rather rather than uh, where they start. And, and because that would help uh, solidify in the minds of students of these activities that even if I might be starting on a, a rung of the ladder that's lower than someone else in the group or on the team, that that's not really what matters. The mat What matters is that we're all climbing the ladder together and that we're all trying to end up at a certain place. And that would be a dramatically more um, healthy way to think about this concept of talent. Thoughts? If your school or church are in the market for staging products like risers, shells, podiums, movable platforms, all of the things that you need to set your choir up for success, I would like to strongly urge you to check out StageRite. StageRite's products are sturdy, they're durable, they're easy to use. I have personal experience with the acoustical shells and some of the platforms that they have at StageRite, and I can tell you, compared to some of the more expensive competitors, they are a really great option to fit inside of a tight school budget, but also to give you the durability and usability that you need. So check out StageRite at StageRite.com. Just a quick note that there is a new home for the Coralosophy free newsletter. Go to Coralosophy.substack.com to subscribe for free, and you will not miss a beat of what happens on this show and at your own pace, which is the beautiful thing about podcasts. I absolutely agree. I, and the, the way I resent the word talent in as much as it locks people into this fixed mindset around right. all that we're doing. And if if people are using that word and it's unlocking, you know, it's inspiring people and it's encouraging people, then I don't care how it's used. But but when I when I hear people say, you know, my daughter is talented, why isn't she singing a solo on the concert today? Well, <laughs> you know, there's a you know, there's a thousand reasons I could give that parent that that didn't happen. Usually it's just uh your child is an angel and you're right, I was wrong not to give her a solo. We'll try next semester. But uh uh, you know, I yeah, I, I I hope all the time that I can use that word to inspire people and and get them to stop thinking about where they started and just focus on where they're going. Just as you said, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, and I do sometimes encounter. It's a reason I wanted to throw it out there. I do sometimes encounter people who will say that um, that talent in that sense doesn't exist, and that everyone is really. It's like this blank slate argument that everybody really truly is capable of the same things and there are no disparities in what certain people are able to do, you know, and, and then of course I would say, okay, so if, if I work um, X amount of hard, I could be LeBron James. No, uh, there is no amount of basketball work that I could ever do. Um, even if I had started at age five to where I could achieve what LeBron James achieves in basketball. Um, in the same way, I think that exists in music. I think that exists in academics. There are disparities in um, how we are, how we enter the world with our the wiring of our brain. And I actually think that's a beautiful thing. What matters, though, is like you said, you brought up fixed mindset. That's the best, I think, the best way to think about it. As long as we don't allow people to think of it as something that is fixed in time, is that where you start does not have to be where you end up. If we can figure out a way to communicate that to students, uh, that's then that's where we get, I think. I agree. <clears throat> now, the problem is, is that this is, you know, this is a quaint conversation that many of us have had together as we've talked about talent and recruitment and all these things. The problem is, is that as choral directors, this issue can spring up on us at times that we're not prepared. For instance, um, you are the artistic director of a community choir and the community choir doesn't have this legacy kind of board of directors, but maybe it's a, like, I just started a choir a couple of years ago and they have a board of directors is very new. What about when you're dealing with volunteer board members who are performing duties on your choir's board of directors that they're not necessarily professional at and not necessarily adept at yet? How am I as a artistic director who usually um we in those positions kind of become the the are still the encouraging factor in a in a board meeting um how are we going to unlock people's potential and and encourage them without getting them stuck so they think well i'm a 
dentist and I sing in the choir, how do you want me to run the social media? I don't understand that. Um, because we do have a lot of wonderfully capable and, you know, talented, um, graphic design people. They, they, most of them are not on the boards of community choirs. And so, um, you know, how, how do we encourage these folks to do that? How do we remain cautious um, as we get everyone inspired that we're not getting them just kind of stuck in a different corner. Mm -hmm. Those are big, big questions that I find um, occupy most of my working time in terms of all the problem solving that we have to do in this position of, of doing this. Um, that's most of the, most of the stuff I spend my time on um, in the church. You get people in the congregation who, who sing beautifully, but don't want to be in the choir. And this is also an irritating factor to this idea of talent because they, people think, well, they sing beautifully. Why aren't they singing in the choir? Well, th there must be something wrong. Well, that's not a good assumption to make. There's probably mm. nothing wrong. They probably are just coming to worship and singing and being happy and they don't want to be in the choir. <laughs> and then there are people who are in the congregation who, um, probably you know feel about singing a solo like you said you feel about, about being kind of like lebron james and they're never going to sing a solo but man they have a home in the choir they absolutely can learn a part and participate and contribute wonderfully to a choir and shaping those conversations and that experience for them um makes the discipline of being a conductor and picking music and playing the organ um seem like child's play mm -hmm. um, while we try to try to love on these people around us yeah. Yeah. The church choir is, a, I think, a really good example of this. I work with a church group as well. And we just had our uh, back to the season party. You know, we take the summer off like a lot of church choirs do. And uh, we just had our return to choir get together last night. And there was, there were, uh, excitingly, there were some new folks from the congregation who showed up um, and, uh, and were interested in singing in the choir. And it's almost uh, without exception, that when new folks think about joining a church choir, it's almost like they they behave the way that people who are trying to dip their toe into the water in the springtime when the pool has just opened and it's still a little bit cold, uh, they, they behave that way. Um, it's almost never just like, hey, I'm going to show up and lead my section on day one. There's always this there's a pre there's almost like a pretense that they have to create uh, to make sure that everyone knows that they're like that they know that they're not as good as everyone else but that they'll work on it and maybe maybe I'll do the choir and there's always this kind of hesitancy and I think that's that what we're talking about right now is kind of where that comes from it's it's this this concern that because music is a thing that talented people do that if I don't see myself as talented then I don't belong there um, and, and but then of course that ignores all of the things that happen when you once you dive in so to speak to the pool and just join the choir and you spend time there you spend that effort working is that then you know fast forward a couple of years and all of a sudden you look to the congregation like one of those talented people and, and they don't see that that is the progression that oftentimes happens and another way to think of it would be that you know if we if we think about those those great, you mentioned Mozart at the beginning of the episode. If we think of uh, that talented means Mozart, then what we're really doing is we're going to that tiny, tiny fraction of the top 0.1% of a percent type musicians and using that as our standard for what we, <laughs> for what we, how we define talent, uh, rather than thinking of talent as simply the, simply the act of climbing the ladder. And I think if we could make it, if we could make that people's idea, is we could call everyone talented if they are working, if they are improving, if they are contributing. And that got, you know, the, the book, The Talent Code, mm, kind of yeah. puts that beautifully. And uh, when people mention Mozart, because they're apt to do that, you know, I remind them that he had an extremely talented and well-connected father who put his children through hell, teaching them to be uh, musicians when they were very, very young. And so they had a lot of experience um, by the time they were 12 and 13 especially Mozart, but also his sister. But, uh, but by the time he was 12 and 13 and writing those first operas and first symphonies, he had as many, he had more, more years of experience in music and certainly more hours than most people do when they graduate from their master's program or whatever. And uh, it's, I'm not surprised that he knew, um, you know, enough music and had heard enough music to do that. It's still inspiring and wonderful to me to imagine a 13 year old kid, you know, writing these things down on a piece of paper you know we can still look up to that 
but um, you know, he he had put in the hours, mm-hmm. whether he wanted to or not. I'm not sure of his attitude about that. Um, but he loved his father, so it's not like uh, you know, don't believe the lies of Amadeus that he was sort of afraid of his father. He loved his father, right, and his mother. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good. I, let's let's talk about Mozart for a second because I do think that's a good analogy for this concept. It would be a mistake to ignore the fact that he what he did show in his early life an unusual amount of aptitude for music, which was then. Uh, so this goes back to that blank slate idea. He wasn't just an average kid, in terms of music, um, and so he 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 did get a little bit of a uh, w- whether it be whether you believe it would be like a genetic boost or a a chance uh, chance roll of the dice where his brain was wired for music in a in a way that is different than the average person. So he got to start maybe on the third rung of the ladder instead of the first. Okay, but then it would also be a mistake. To, to only, th- only think about and romanticize that early childhood uh, boost that he had. And I think a lot of people do that when they talk about a, a savant musician or a genius musician or, or whatever. They romanticize that starting place as being so far ahead. And then they, then they miss those thousands and thousands of hours that, that went into taking that, that maybe that little leg up that he had from his birth and then adding all those hours so again, the analogy would be: Let's say I started on on rung one, and Mozart started on rung three, but then in that situation, maybe I did the th- the ten thousand hours, and he didn't. And then all of a sudden, several years later, I'm at rung five, and he's still at rung three. Right. And then and then, and then who is the more talented musician? Well, and then that, it seems like such a silly question to ask, right? In that, in a- that sense, yes. doesn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I believe that and wholeheartedly. And I, I, I struggle with that when I hear others talking like that, too. I, I have gotten myself into trouble a few times, sort of uh, taken up for that cause in those moments uh, or, or shortly thereafter. Um, because, you know, we I have seen people's whole musical lives crushed by people with a fixed mindset using the word talent like an, a weapon. Um, and I have also seen people with maybe even no, no pre-existing thought about being a musician suddenly inspired to be in a choir and suddenly very capable and suddenly very, you know, belonging in a, in a choir as much as anyone else um, based on uh, the, the one interaction. And so I, t- I take these things very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, there may have been a day when we had lots of chances, but these days um, I think you get a few Mm. And then people stop stop coming and talking to you. Um, I, I I hope people will f- be forgiving and come back, but you never know. Right, right. You mentioned the talent code. Um, let's let's go there a little bit because I I do want to take a chance to uh, kind of highlight that book for audience members who maybe don't know it. Um, Certainly, I I for- personally found it um, to be a an eye opening and revolutionizing uh, book for my teaching career. Um, not not only because it taught me things, certain things about the brain that I I was prior prior to that book I was not aware uh, of certain things about the way that the uh, that we learn and that the way that we develop skills on a neurological level. Uh, mm-hmm. When I read this many years ago, but it also it was revolutionizing for me as a teacher because it gave me better language to explain these things to kids um, in a way that they can really understand. I now I now even show. Um, graphic images on my screen at school of of myelin sheaths being built around uh, neurons and uh, and like I show that these are things that like when you practice, it's not just an esoteric in the ether thing that's happening. You're actually growing new parts of your body <laughs> when you when you do that um, in the same way because they can see, for example, they can see that when a person goes to the gym, they're building muscles that are visible. Um, but in our brains, through reading the talent code, it kind of helps you understand that you're actually doing that in a real physical, concrete sense when you exercise your brain yeah. as well. It's just that your head doesn't get bigger, <laughs> so yeah, you, you can't see that. Uh, well, so one hopes one hopes your head doesn't get right, bigger. Exactly, exactly. The whole like bigger head equals smarter doesn't really uh, that, that part's not true. Um, but the premise I've got a, a little summary here in front of me just so we can throw out some ideas, but. Uh, the author of the book visited nine different talent hotspots around the world and witnessed something very different during the other half of the time he was there 
uh, for so for half of the time that he was there, um, is these moments of slow, fitful struggle from all these very talented people. And so uh, it, this kind of goes at what we were talking about before when I, we were talking about the Mozart example. We we see the 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 musical mountaintops of Mozart because that's what filters down through history, uh, but we don't see the those those fitful struggling hours of practicing and doing the same little passage on the keyboard or an instrument or or whatever over and over and over until it's exactly right every single time and of course then the book the author introduces the concept of deep practice um is so how do, how do you think of uh, of deep practice is that a concept that you that that is useful to you at all do you talk to your musicians about that much Absolutely. And I, I train them to recognize when they are actually practicing. Um, and, you know, this idea of, of the brain, you know, literally growing new parts when we learn the way you described it earlier, I thought that was beautiful. You can imagine that's just as inspiring to, or maybe even a diff- in a different way, even more inspiring to a 75-year-old singer in a church choir as it is in, to a singer in, in a high school choir. I mean, we're all we all should be inspired by the idea that we can always be learning. I think the the difficult lesson, um, no matter what the age of the student is, is is that oh, by the way, this is going to take some hard work, and it's not just going to be going through it over and over. And while you're distracted, it's going to. I, I want to see you sweat. I want to see your brows furrow. Um, you may even uh, some some people when they're working really hard, they tend to tear up a little. Fine. Okay. I don't want, I hope no one cries in a rehearsal or in a practice session, but it'd be no, sometimes that can be part, you know, but, but when I teach people um, to really dig in and really, really show and feel some exertion, they all tend to grow faster and, and, and learn more. Um, that that's another parallel with athletes. I mean, when they come in from a hard workout or a hard practice, they look like it. Um, I had, I had one student who would come in after football practice to my choir when I taught high school for a little while. And he would say, uh, Mr. Mazur, I smell tired today. Well, good. Sit back there. And he, and he sang beautifully. Um, uh, but he, you know, him being in the room kind of taught me, you know, we don't have a whole lot of ways to show that we've been working really hard. Um, so I encourage people to give into the little things like just that furrowed brow, that slow, fitful um, uh, approach to, to, to progress um, and, and encourage them that they will see the results. And I try to demonstrate to them those results as well. Uh, when I teach voice lessons, for instance, I always record my students' lessons, whether they do or not. And then when they inadvertently, you know, at some point, point everyone always comes into my studio and they say i just haven't made any progress and i was like well let's let's see how much progress you made sing that let's check the tape <laughs> and let's check the tape oh my goodness you are like a different person a different singer everything um and so it is true yeah whether we can see it or not um and it's just as true for a 75 80 year old singer in a church choir as it is for a a, a spring chicken in, in a middle school choir or a high school choir and um that's something I teach actively because I think I think it's something they, they these people can apply throughout their lives, not just in their musical life. But right now, you said a second ago, you, I want to uh, zero in on something you said because you said you train students to understand whether or not they're actually practicing, or something al- along those lines. Uh, give us some examples of that, maybe uh, whether it's the seventy-five-year-old church choir or the the you know the collegiate voice student or whatever it is. Um, what would be some examples of things that people think are practicing but aren't? Well, you know, I'm thinking about this actively because I, I also feel very strongly that my rigorous practice will not look like your rigorous practice. And um, while there are some guiding principles, I, I also don't want anyone walking around suddenly judging other people differently because they're not looking like them or looking like we described. But generally, um, you know, I, I've had voice students. I say, when do you practice? I mean, what time do you practice? How do you do that? Well, every every time I come to my lesson in my car, I'm singing the whole way. I sang for an hour to my lesson. Okay, yeah. well, maybe practicing in your car without the music in front of you, hopefully, is not like the most rigorous practice we can imagine. So I just kind of ju- guide them into, you know, a different way. And eventually, with these voice students, you, you you know, they get, Oh, so I need to be in a practice room. I need to set aside time needs to be 
more than just right before my lesson. I need to have all my music there. I need to have my music bound. I need to have my translations. I need to have my phone handy so that I can look things up. I need to study who the composer is. I need to know about the romantic period. I need to know what the flowers look like in the, in the countryside um, uh, of Ireland before I sing this song. I have to do all that before I, well, not maybe not before, but maybe during and maybe at some point, um, you know, practices all of that as a singer. And the, the bottom line is that at the end of the day, they realize they're not committing enough effort to this total study of what they're doing for, uh, mm -hmm. for a young pianist. It might be, um, yes, I, I spend an hour playing scales. Okay. But are you really thinking about scales? Are you really thinking about the tone you're creating? Are you making them musical? Are you practicing different little things? Are or I, one of my first music teachers was my flute teacher in high school. And I proudly walked into my first lesson with her. Her name was uh, Barbara Dinger Jacobson, uh, also at Florida Southern. And um, I proudly, when she asked, said that, I yes, of course, I know all 12 major scales in two or three octaves. And she said, okay, play them all in thirds. Couldn't. She's like, you don't know your scales. Play them in fourths, play them in fifths, play them in sixths. You don't know your scales. There's always more. And unless you're constantly, carefully, slowly pushing forward in that way, um, then you're not really practicing. You're just sort of doing. And, and you know, you have to have an intention. Um, but the most important thing I think that we can all look at is this furrowed brow thing. That's what I always come back to. Because no matter what instrument they play or how progressed they are in their advancement as a musician or whatever, the, universally, I notice that people who are really trying have a furrowed brow. So I tell them, when you feel that brow furrowing, you you dig into that. You let that happen. You let that drive you forward. And that frustration, when you feel desperately frustrated, you uh, you need to know that you are at the precipice of, of a great um, progression in your ability when you find that you just can't handle it anymore. And I I also tell them sometimes if it's the end of a longer session and you feel very, very frustrated, you may stop and come back the next day and find that you can do what you were trying to do. Um, so it's not about killing yourself, but it's about um, being very committed to what you're trying to learn and intentionally going after that in a, in a, in a uh, slow and steady and fitful. I love that word fitful because that's what it feels like in the middle of it, but a slow and steady way. Um, and if you're not feeling frustrated or, or confounded by something you're working on, then you're probably not making progress. Yeah. Yeah. You call it furrowed brow. I sometimes refer to it with my students as just the uh, simply being confused uh, because, I, <laughs> because what I, what I will say to them is if, uh, you know, in a very real sense is if you're not confused, you're not learning, um, it either, because if you're, if you've gotten to the point where, uh, that that kind of flow state happens where you're doing the singing the passage or playing the passage or whatever and it's perfect and you're no longer having to put any effort into it well that that uh, that neural pathway has already been formed and and that's good and you want to keep reinforcing that uh, and playing it beautifully every time or singing it beautifully every time but it also that means it's you're you're ready to move on to another thing uh, you know, you're building, you're building those pathways. Uh, and so I, you know, I explained to them that, that if you're not confused, you're not learning simply means that once you get past the confusion, you need to seek the next moment of confusion. <laughs> and, and that, that, that feeling of, you call it fitful or that state of fitfulness or that state of furrowed brow, uh, that that's kind of like going to the gym and feeling those sore muscles. That's how you yes. know that's how you know that those those pathways are being formed. But I do also think it's important to make sure the students know that it's not enough to just feel confused. You do need to be verifying that what, that you're practicing it correctly, uh, or, or else you're going to form a neural pathway that makes it very very easy to do it wrong. And I think that's where those those seventy five year old church choir members sometimes come into their um, their insecurity is because they've it's it's the whole myth about you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Right. So, well, like yes you can, but there's a good reason neurologically why it's harder for them sometimes to feel like they can be successful learning to do something a new way. It's because their neural pathways are well insulated uh of about however they used to do it. It's so true. And uh 
it's funny that I, I you you did make that description, and the first thing I think of is a student I had last year who was this wonderful flute player, and she was only 18 years old, but she had been playing flute a long time, and uh, her teacher had had her convinced that she had done everything right, that she was on the way to a professional career as a flute player, and when she arrived in my uh, ear training class. She had literally no ability to learn new musical skills. With the, asking her to sing in solfege, asking her to use uh, curl and hand signs, um, asking her to use takadimi was like I was asking her to give up her entire hope for her future because that, <laughs> those were things that she did not know. Right. And um, now I, a lot of people get frustrated with that very quickly, but I, I really find a, a well of compassion in myself for that kind of person because I was the same way. I arrived in college with this very, very uh, um, stalwart sense that I knew what I was doing Mm -hmm. and uh, encountered Carol Krieger, who in her ear training class was asking me to do the same things I was asking this flute player to do last year. And I told her because I was a a bit of a butthead in college, um, as many of us may have been, uh, I was, Uh, I told her, I said, you know, I I don't think I was an angel. I was an angel. You were an angel. Yeah. Well, good for you. Stop bragging. <laughs> I, I I wasn't. And so I told her, I said, I said, Dr. Krieger, I don't think there's, I don't think I have to do this. I don't understand why I have to do it. I can read. I can sight sing. I just do my little flute fingerings while I'm sight singing. I think I'm fine. She said, Joshua, just try. Come to the class. Spend time working on it. And just see what happens. And I said, fine, you know what? I'm going to come and I'm going to work on it to prove to you that it doesn't make any difference. Well, do I need to tell you the end of the story? I mean, the end of the year, suddenly I could hear and do things that I had. I, I was aware of so much more in music because of that comprehensive literacy that she gifted me that I I couldn't imagine going back to what how I approached music beforehand. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, in choir... We, we approach some important repertoire, but it's not like you, it's not like you're singing Mozart in sight singing class, you know? Um, and, you know, she, she has some beautiful folk melodies in her books. There's, there's all kinds of great melodies, but it's not like you're singing symphonies. So it's not like I, again, that Mozart came out of heaven or something and touched me with his symphony number 40 and I became a better musician. No, Carol Krieger looked at a butthead and said, I just want you to try and I want your results to speak for themselves. And if you try this way and work this hard, they will. No one's probably no one has ever told me something as true as that. Right. Um, and and I would not be where I am today at all if it weren't for those two short years with uh, Dr. Krieger in college. I mean, she just changed my life completely. Yeah, she is. Uh, I would say that she is doing some pretty incredibly important work. And her uh, her episode ninety on this show. Um, is very quickly going to, I think, become the most most downloaded show on this entire catalog uh, of almost five years. And uh, it sh- I think give her a few months, and she's going to pass my uh, my huge episode with a COVID expert back in April of 2020 that like was tagged mm. by the New York Times and downloaded tens and tens of thousands of times in like three days. So like that episode for like if you look at my stats, that one episode from back in 2020 is still the top one because that was a weird little flash in the pan moment. Right. But Carol's like about to that point, and I think it speaks to um, the this idea that the music educators really um, are clamoring for the information about how to get kids to be able to do exactly what you just described. Um, you know, and, and I think that, that that's such an important such an important concept is the, the, the to convince the student first that this is even possible like the that this idea of of taking your um your fixed mindset and transforming it into a thing that you can build methodically and grow because we can't see our muscles growing like the ones at the gym oftentimes students just don't believe that it is even possible and like we're trying to sell them a myth Absolutely. You know what I mean? There's one dynamic to this whole thing, though, that I think is very understated and underestimated. And that is the power we have as people um, in those places to do that work. Um, Dr. Krieger, at the time I met her, did not resemble the uh, old church ladies at my church growing up. 
um, who defended my right to and liberty to play the piano in the fellowship hall. Um, but she had just as much of an impact, if not more, because she was placed, um, she was in a position, in a place where she could tell me what she told me. Mm-hmm. And um, she is very much aware of what she's there to do and what she does really well. And so as a teacher and as a director, um, I take the same thing on board. I, I, I'm just always discovering more about where I think I might belong in this business and in music. And, uh, you know, I like being the person that has a bunch of success convincing people that maybe they didn't think they could do this, that they actually can. Um, and if there's, there's nothing like watching in your choir and seeing people who a year before didn't think they could sing in the Alleluia section at the end of Lordson's Lux Eterna, singing their faces off with tears streaming down their face because they never thought they would be able to do that. I, I know that I, I do that. And I also enjoy being the kind of teacher that's ready to say, you know, I think you need to go take lessons with professor whoever. Um, I, I, I do very, very well teaching people from the ground up and getting people going. And then I'm really happy to connect them with really capable teachers who are more talented at taking people, look, I use that word, um, who, who have some ability and really crafting them into artists. Um, and I enjoy being around fellow musicians um, and, and, and immersing myself in things like this podcast so that I'm always thinking and always growing about how, you know, what my little place is. People forget that Pavarotti had a church choir director Mm. and he sang with his dad and his dad had a beautiful voice. And that probably had a huge impact on who Pavarotti was as a person. Um, Jesse Norman, when Jesse Norman passed away, I was one of the first people at her wake at uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. It's a little old church. Yeah. It has a choir. There's a choir director there. The, her choir director growing up was not a choir director like Robert Shaw. Yet her time in her, her church choir and in her school choir were formative to her career and her life as a musician. And she said so many times. Yeah. So I don't have to be Robert Shaw to have an intensely important impact on the lives of the people I happen to be put in charge of um, who are in my care. Um, and that is a wonderfully comforting thought. Yeah. Um, and also I have to remember as I teach other people to remember that you, you have to um, continue working in a slow methodical and maybe even fitful way and furrowing that brow being confused and uh, that's the only way, whether you're Robert Shaw, Jesse Norman, Ray Fleming, Luciano Pavarotti, or Joshua Mazur, or Chris Montz. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just the same. Beautiful. Yeah, you mentioned Pavarotti, and I think another thing people forget is that with people like him, at least with him specifically, people forget that in well into his 70s, he was still practicing a lot and taking voice lessons. He he was He was recognizing that he still needed those tune-ups. Um, I had a, a, a just a quick story, and then I want to take us into one final segment here. Um, but I was on a choir tour to New York City when I was 17 with my high school choir, and we were just taking a tour, walking through one of the big, you know, kind of, I can't even remember, St. Matthew's or St. Michael's or one of the big uh, but kind of historical churches there in, in New York City. And we walked in just to look at the church, and I heard this operatic tenor um, practicing from the choir loft. And, uh, and I, I turn around and look up there and it was Pavarotti practicing. Oh my goodness gracious. He was, he was simply up there practicing in the choir loft at the church. Uh, nobody was there except for our little group we were walking through. Um, and then I, we walked outside. Of course, I'm the only one nerdy enough in the high school choir to know that that was Luciano Pavarotti. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm freaking out. And, and I, I mentioned it to the tour guide and she's like, oh yeah, he lives across the street. He lives in an apartment and he walks over here all the time to, to practice. Uh, I love it. Yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, so, have you have you seen a YouTube video um, that describes this concept of neural pathway formation as creating paths through the forest? Does this sound familiar to you? 
that sounds like a familiar concept. I don't remember seeing a YouTube okay. video. But. So what I'd like to do, because I want to make sure uh, kind of in this last little segment of our conversation that for the folks that maybe haven't read the talent code, we've kind of been da- dancing around this idea of kind of the science aspect of uh, of talent, uh, of kind of creating talent in your own brain, so to speak, um, is I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen share this video. It's very short, um, and let you watch it, and then also the audience will be able to hear it slash watch it, um, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about some more about that concept because I want to make sure that the audience is kind of left with the idea of hey, I need to learn more about this uh, this this aspect of it. So if you wouldn't mind indulging me for just a second, what's going on in the brain when you learn? In order to learn anything, whether it's math, a foreign language, guitar, or how to dribble a basketball, you need to create and strengthen pathways in your brain. Think about shooting a free throw. Know that feeling when you've got it down and don't even have to think about it? That's muscle memory. Here's the thing. Muscle memory lives in the brain, not the muscles. Your brain controls everything your muscles do, and it does this by activating specific neural pathways for each and every movement. These are functional pathways, neurons working together to achieve a goal. Say you're learning how to shoot a free throw. If it's your first time doing it, you don't yet have a pathway for that movement in your brain. You need to create it. Let's use an analogy to look at what's happening in the brain during this time. When you're first learning, your brain is like a forest full of trees and dense foliage, with no clear pathway between point A and point B. As you learn the mechanics of shooting a free throw, you create a trail through the forest. Now you can shoot the free throw because you've created that pathway in your brain, but you probably don't make many shots because it's so new. The pathway isn't very clear yet. In order to improve your free throw, you need to refine and strengthen the free throw pathway in your brain. The way you do that is through practice. Practice gradually widens the trail through the trees, turning it into a dirt road between A and B. You're starting to get pretty good now. You're making more free throws than not. You don't have to think about the mechanics as much. That's because the pathway gets stronger after each practice rep. And you've done a lot of reps. With even more practice, the dirt road turns into a paved road connecting A and B, allowing information to be transmitted at a faster rate. Now you're a 70% free throw shooter. And when you step up to the line, you don't even have to think about it. Eventually, with enough practice, what started as a trail has become a full-blown highway. Now you're a master, draining almost every free throw, and the movement is completely second nature. Scientists call this plasticity, and it's your brain's innate ability to create and strengthen connections between neurons. These connections are the path through the forest. To, uh, great, but, great video though isn't that great yeah i always show the first two minutes of that um to my classes as a way to just very quickly uh introduce this idea of um of neuroplasticity uh and also to help them visualize uh that these things are are real and they're physical uh and that there are um there there, there are right ways to practice and and wrong ways to practice and so one of the things that I, I tell my voice students, and I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about this too, is I tell them that almost never, when we're practicing, do we just start the song at the beginning and sing to the end of the song. Because um, it, and until we have uh, deep practiced, as the, the talent code calls it, um, all the way through the song, what we would be doing, we would run the risk of glossing over certain portions of a song that right. we have not yet formed a solid neural pathway for and inadvertently create a very well-paved highway that goes the wrong direction. And and then, one, and then once we do that, it's very difficult to fix it. So I always suggest mm-hmm. students, um, when I think of, have them learn learning about what deep practice means is I always use the analogy of zooming in. Like we're going to zoom in on a portion of the music. We're going to slow it down we're going to do it exactly correctly. And so even if, so for example, maybe you're only able to do two notes in a row exactly correctly on a portion. Well, then that's how far you have to zoom in on that part until that part becomes so insulated that you can then zoom out to include more of the phrase. And then maybe your, your level of analysis is the phrase. I can now sing this phrase 
without any tension, without any frustration, any more of that confusion or furrowed brow, I can sing that. And then I'm able to zoom out. So I go from a zoomed in to a zoomed out approach with students with their practice. Um, is Does that sound familiar to you or is that something you do? Absolutely. I, do, I try to do that. I, um, I, I do that very much in in the classroom at the college um, because we are there to learn those skills Mm -hmm. you have to be crafty about that in front of a church choir you you know (laughs) you have to be crafty about that in front of a community choir but but you can uh, you know rightly inspired they will they will take that on board and do that um uh sometimes um but but i do absolutely try there are other there are other factors involved in those two settings you know uh, the, the other thing I'm cautious about is is getting people in a church choir to think that they have to be perfect in order to be worthy, and that that is something I would rather have more notes wrong in the service music for that Sunday than have anyone walk away from my choir rehearsal in in our church feeling like um, the worthiness of their offering is based on the quality of it. I, I just can't stand with that. But that's, um, a, that's a really uh, good point. Yeah, they're, they're, the contexts matter. Yeah. Right, and if you try if you try to go hardcore on zooming in with the church choir and make it about that, you might kill that choir. So, I, I would encourage people to be very careful about how they apply these things. Right, and but but for us, for me and you, we have to be cognizant of that, and we have to try and lead them down those ways one way or the other. And we ha- we do have to be crafty about it. Um, the you know all of this kind of comes to a, a focal point in us right at the front of the room. And no matter where you are, or what level you're working on, there are two things that I think are essential to remaining the person who can encourage this and who can live this out for people to see. Number one, we have to seek out feedback from people who know more and have more experience and do more than us. Um, I, th- I find... Um, you know, and this is not a, the slam that it sounds, but, you know, as, as I look around, as far as I can tell, and I take notice of, of, of many of our colleagues, uh, I see a lot of people pigeonholed in their classroom at their high school and they do it the way they've done it. And that's fine. But um, the problem with this whole thing, like the talent code and, and like, uh, uh, is that that's a beautiful packaging for that idea. And it was perfect for that moment. And then suddenly it's 10 years old or more. And things have changed, and we have to package this in a different way. Um, and the the only way we can do that is if we are under the the, the mentorship of people who know more and, and can and can point things out to us. Um, I don't see as much people rejecting feedback and criticism as I do see people just avoiding any feedback and criticism at all. And um, something you've talked about a lot over the years is how social media does this. It's like we are not allowed to offer feedback or criticism and to do so is rude. And I, while I, I do not personally, you know, take to the Facebook comments to offer that criticism and feedback that the online culture of that has a profound impact on how I relate to other choir directors and other musicians when I'm out in this real world and we're just doing work together, Um, particularly as a singer I mean, it's, it's, you you know, it's, it's damn near impossible to, to get through a rehearsal without offending somebody um, these days. And um, I understand that completely, but I, I also push back on that a little bit um, where I can, because it is good for us to be in places where there are people who know things we don't, who are happy to tell us the things that we don't know. And uh, I only see benefit to that for myself. I, I don't run into a bunch of issues with uh, needing to pretend like I know everything. Um, uh, nothing inspires me more than, than, you know, learning something new or stumbling on a new work and, you know, uh, learning it. It just means that there's so much more music and so much music and so little time. And I just kind of, at the end of the day, feel blessed to be in all this. So. Yeah, that's a really good summary because, you know, and I'll say, um, maybe this would be a a good chance for me to give a comment and give you a chance to make a final word here as we wrap this up, because I, um, I do talk a lot about that, uh, both on the podcast and on social media about the importance of 
uh, of this balance, I guess, between curiosity and being offended. Uh, because the... Um, I, so here's how I would say it, maybe, in this context, in response to what you just said. There's nothing wrong, per se, with finding something offensive. Sometimes things are legitimately offensive. and but, but as long as we recognize that it's possible that it's offensive to me, but not you, and who's to say that I'm the one that's right? Um, right. So there, there, that's a, that's a, their humility's got to be wrapped in there some a little bit to a certain level. Uh, but also, in my opinion, curiosity should should be the heavier uh, weight in the equation than the offense. In other words, if I'm offended before I've asked any questions, <laughs> then I pr that's probably a sign th of my lack of humility. So if my first instinct, let's, when I see something on social media, is to be offended, if my first instinct is that, um, then I, that's where I come in and I say, okay, guys, I think this is the wrong approach. If, if we've asked some clarifying questions, if we've asked, made, made some attempt to understand what the person was trying to communicate, and then we're still offended, well, that's a, that's a little bit better. <laughs> you know, yeah, you pro I mean? pro probative questions are very important. Yes, uh, because it, we, have to, we have to have the humility to understand that, uh, that the thing you said uh, in the terminology you might have used on, on a post, might, you might mean something completely different than how I would interpret that. And so I at least need to try to get to the bottom of what it is you're actually trying to say. Yes. And, 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 and rather than saying, uh, you know, it's the whole classic, um, so you're saying that blah, 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 and then I fill out and I, I replace your words with my own words. And well, that's just not a good faith argumentation. Um, you know, so that that's important. And I think uh, all of these, these things that just uh, from from building uh, our own skill base and building our talent base as educators, as performers, uh, requires a little bit of that curiosity and uh, and humility in order to even achieve these things we've been talking about uh, in this conversation. So I'll give you the final word of what you'd like to communicate about this idea. I appreciate it. Well, absolutely. I, I'm very thankful to have been here. And uh, I would jump right on something you just said, which I found interesting. You said, you know, humility has to be part of that. I, I sort of believe that humility has to be centered mm. in what we're doing. Yep. Um, because I find that when humility starts to wane and ego starts to grow our curiosity wanes as well yep. so you know all of these things that you know contribute and participate in our good practice and our good ability to encourage people um, and build people whether they be singers in our choirs or board members or family of our singers who have to go there tuesdays and wednesday nights or whatever with not their family at dinner time because they're in choir rehearsal. No matter what we're doing, um, having humility centered in that um, is is essential. Now, humility is not humiliation. <laughs> True. I, I I fight that so hard everywhere I go. To be humble does not mean to humiliate yourself or to um, grovel. Right. We don't need to grovel. We don't need to be humiliated, and we have to be cognizant of when that feeling of humiliation takes over. Um, one thing I see more and more in, in the kids who had to, you know, be online for a year or more during COVID is that correction will often make them feel humiliated. And so it is essential that we teach them and everyone else, because I also know 70 year olds who, who encounter correction and feel humiliated, that that correction is love, that discipline is not beating somebody, it's discipling them. And if you think of a shepherd with his staff lightly touching you know, the shoulder of sheep on this side of the flock in order to keep them together in love, that is that is more like the image of education in my mind. And uh, in order to be a shepherd, you have to know about sheep. But um, I, I don't think we have to feel humiliated. And I would also rebuke those who teach in a way that um, offers correction um, in subtle humiliation or in a passive aggressive way that teaches people that we're better than them because we know. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, but centering everything in humility um, is 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 the key to all of this. And um, those church ladies humbled that man that tried to close that piano 
and Carol Krieger humbled me. And if those two things hadn't occurred, and if I hadn't had the many myriad people who from a place of humility taught me as they did, um, I would be in no position to um, model myself after them now, mm-hmm. and nor, would, nor would I have accomplished what I've been blessed to have the opportunity to do. And I feel very strongly that we, you know, we, we, people complain about the the numbers in our music classes and in our, you know, the dwindling, you know, music scene, a classical music scene. I, I just think that we would see a, a great revolution um, and a big turnaround on that if uh, we would center ourselves in humility and teach this way, um, rather than letting this word talent become a, a, a baseball bat with which we can go hunting with. I don't I just that's about it. But you know, these are these are un- incomplete thoughts. I'm always thinking about this. I think we should always be pondering it. Yeah. And uh, I hope it's helpful to somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Those are beautiful, uh, beautiful summaries there. And of course, yes, you're right. Uh, we can talk about this for an hour and still feel like it's an incomplete thought process. And that's not necessarily bad, but I would say it's definitely better than just typing, you know, 100 characters into a social media post about it and you know, we can go a lot more into depth, which is what we've done here. So Joshua, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I think people are going to find this thought provoking. I hope so. Thank you so very much for all you do too. And uh, all the other episodes I've been happy to hear have uh, inspired me as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you as always for sticking around to listen to the meat of the conversation. I hope you got something out of that. Of course, there are huge things that you can do to help. Enter Coralosophy at checkout at all the websites that allow you to do so. It helps you and it helps me a lot. So go to ryanmain.com, which is now endeavormusicpublishing.com. You can go to either and enter Coralosophy at checkout there, as well as graphitepublishing.com, sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, and here in the show notes on this website, you can find your copy of the Voce Vista software. So go to coralosophy.com forward slash Voce hyphen Vista. All of those programs and products are awesome people uh, that really are helpful, incredible products for your coral classroom or organization, and you can use that discount code to save money. And then, of course, go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and subscribe there for as little as $3 a month. And don't forget to subscribe to the new newsletter. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.